Welcome and be inspired with Dominic. And today we're going to talk about tentacles. Well, basically, because that's probably the most important takeaway from my last video, Monster in a Can Part 2, the sequel. In it, I made wooden, basically appendages, tentacles, whatever you want to call it. And in this video, I want to go into the technique I used for that a little bit more. So I'm standing next to my miter saw and there's a reason for that, but it has actually nothing to do with what I'm talking about now. Because to illustrate the technique I used for the tentacles, I made some models. And even before I dropped them for no reason whatsoever, it was pretty hard to put them back together. So I'll just show you the video I recorded when cutting these. The idea is that you cut a, a shape. You don't even have to taper it. You can use a, a, a dowel, but let's stick to two dimensions for now. You make a cut and then you rotate one piece 180 degrees. Since both pieces came from the same cut, the, the surface connecting them will be equal. So unlike the tentacles I made where I didn't rotate it 180 degrees all the time, you won't get anything standing out, any edges or whatnot. Then you make another cut and so on. The thing to keep in mind here is how these cuts affect the overall shape. As you can see, if I edit this right, if you mark out a number of cuts that are the same angle, then you'll get well a wobbly shape. If you put these cuts closer together, as opposed to further apart, you can increase or decrease the amount of wiggle. If you alternate your cuts, you'll get a bend. So I hope that gave you an overview of how this thing works, except that that's only two dimensions, but for this you have three. Side note, I also made an instructable about this, so if you want to read rather than have me talk to you, and probably read a little more than I said in this video, check it out over on Instructables. There's a link at least down there, maybe up there somewhere. And I'd appreciate it if you also voted for it for the Halloween contest. So that's two dimensions where you have a cut that you can angle. But we live in three dimensions and so does the dowel you're probably using. There you have a cutting plane. And you can angle it however you want. Just in, like in two dimensions, but you can also rotate it. Uh, that's high tech. So what I did for these is I not only did I angle the cut, I also rotated it from piece to piece. So there are two things I need to mention. Surface and safety. Surface relates to the quality of your clue up because if you have a flat surface, Clue has an easy time to stick to it. If you have ridges or curve marks, not that easy to Clue. So let's go through the list. We have Wood Clue, which is of course the preferred method to connect to wooden pieces, but you need to clamp it. You need to keep it in position and apply pressure for, depending on the Clue you use, five minutes to half an hour, an hour, which is pretty tricky on organic shapes. So that was a no-go for me. There is also a clue on the market that foams up and that would bridge these gaps if you have them. But I don't have that and I think it needs clamping too. Next up we have hot glue, which is pretty good at filling up gaps. But it might not be as stable as the other options. If you don't put too much stress on your tentacle, you should be fine though. And last, and for me not least, the CA glue. That's what I used, but, and that's a segue to the next part, I only use it because I cut my piece on the miter saw, which meant pretty flat edges and a lot of surface for the CA glue to contact. I don't think CA glue would do too well when you have ridges, because imagine this highly sophisticated model. You have these kind of curves on, on your piece when you cut it and then you rotate it. So you only have the, the intersect points to connect and that's really not a lot of surface. But of course you can send the surfaces flat if that's what you want or need. But keep in mind that you should use sandpaper that's somehow backed. The reason for that is otherwise if you send those ridges you might end up with a smooth surface but, and I exaggerate here, bent like this. Which is also my main beef with the bandsaw. You can probably use it but in my experience the blade is pretty prone to wandering just like on the scroll saw where it's even thinner. So you might start a cut straight, but then the blade will wander. On bigger pieces or where the cut is not that critical, you can 
real line, but you want that set angle. So you probably have your mitre gauge set and as you go you get a, well, a bend. And again imagine if that's the cut you make and you twist it then you're stuck with two points of contact. Who would have thought that hands are so good to demonstrate clue-ups? I didn't. And I know I'm talking a lot and I'm trying to put a lot into this because I'm trying to describe a technique and all the, the little things, the bits and bobs that you can modify to get different results, as opposed to simply showing you I did this and this and that and that's the result. So that's a disclaimer I also put on my Instructable, which I just want to remind you of. Please vote in general. There are of course a number of ways to get to the result that you might want. There are many tools, many clues, many combinations of cuts and there's always sanding, which is an integral part and I've glossed over it up to now. And I don't mean sanding the surfaces, but sanding the, the overall shape. In this case a spindle sander is your friend or a dowel wrapped with sandpaper for the inside. The outside should be pretty easy using a belt sander or a random orbital sander. And one last thing from this vantage point, be safe. The mitre saw isn't the most forgiving when it comes to stuff that you'd later want to be forgiven for. And I'm talking about losing digits and other stuff. And I know that kind of got away from me, that sentence. But don't do things you don't want to do just because I said so. Because I'm telling you, don't. Do only what you're comfortable with. And it's better to lose a proto-tentacle than your actual tentacles. And in case you're wondering how I got the holes into the can to look like, well, works of art basically, I hope you're wondering that, I used this little jig and you can see all about it in the video for the first monster in a can. It works really well. If you need holes in a can that look like something burst out from the inside. As you do. I hope you enjoyed this video and the project uh, that it's about. And, well, you might ask why you would want to make a tentacle. It's Halloween. Why wouldn't you? I imagine they would make great garden decorations. Just put some pin or something like that in here and stick them in the garden. Because these ah, zombie hands are so... Well, they're, they're still on work, but... Yeah, you... Why not have under tentacles? And something I didn't touch on, and that's a whole nother can of tentacles probably, is how to paint them. I would recommend, like I did, use a generous amount of spray lacquer to make them look wet and slippery. And you could also use uh, some kind of latex if you have a thin layer to give them some kind of unexpected surface feeling or grip. So if you enjoyed this video, please like it and subscribe to my channel. More is coming, always. If this inspired you, let me know. If you have questions or comments, also, there's room for all of those in the comments below. That's probably why they call them that. I'll see you on the next video. Thanks for watching, and as always, remember to be inspired. Next up we have Hot Clue, which is pretty good at bridging mess bridging masses here yeah, that too. If you don't put too much stress on your tank of tank If you don't put too much stress